Everyone thinks they know what DNA is. It's in your genes. You can't fight your DNA. Genes control everything. It sounds convincing, almost scientific, but here's the truth. Most people who say these things have no idea what genes actually are or how they work. DNA is not destiny. It's not even a blueprint. Let's start with the big question. Have genes ever been proven? Yes, absolutely. But what a gene is has changed over time. The story begins in the 1800s with a monk named Gregor Mendel. By breeding pea plants, he noticed traits like flower color and seed shape, followed mathematical ratios. Something invisible was being passed down. Mendel didn't know it yet, but he had discovered the first evidence of genes. Decades later, scientists confirmed that chromosomes carried these invisible units. By the early 20th century, the word gene was born. The proof arrived in the mid-1900s. First came the discovery that DNA, not proteins, carried genetic information. The Hershey Chase experiment, 1952, showed that viruses injected DNA into bacteria to hijack them. Fast forward to 1953. Watson and Crick, building on Rosalind Franklin's X-ray images, revealed the famous double helix structure of DNA. Suddenly, the molecule of heredity was somewhat visible. But DNA is not magic, it's chemistry. A gene is simply a sequence of nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine that tells a cell how to build a protein or when to activate a process. And we can prove it works. Scientists can take the human gene for insulin, insert it into bacteria, and those bacteria will start producing human insulin. That's how millions of diabetics survive today. With CRISPR gene editing, we can snip out or insert genes with surgical precision, curing certain genetic diseases in experimental trials. So, yes, genes are real. They've been mapped, sequenced, edited, and transplanted. But understanding they exist is only the beginning. People love to say DNA is a blueprint, but that's wrong. A blueprint gives the same results every time. Build a house from a blueprint. It will look the same, brick for brick. DNA doesn't work like that. Let's first abandon the blueprint. It's a useless metaphor. It's more like a recipe book. Recipes can change depending on the ingredients, the timing, the tools, even the chef. And even that metaphor falls short because DNA isn't static, it's interactive. So a better way to think of DNA, it's like a piano, the keys are fixed, but the song played depends on the pianist and the environment is always the pianist. This leads us to one of the most misunderstood areas of modern science, gene expression. The process, gene, RNA, protein, is the foundational rule. But it's a rule without a ruler. It's a system waiting for a command. And that command comes from the world you live in. The signals are everywhere. A hormone released during a workout, a nutrient broken down from your lunch, a stress chemical coursing through your veins, these are the messages from the macro world to the micro world. They are the commands that tell the transcription factors what to do. They are the epigenetic signals. A gene is not destiny, it's potential. Identical twins share virtually the same DNA, but one may develop schizophrenia while the other doesn't. One may become obese while the other stays lean. One may thrive, the other may struggle. Why? Because DNA isn't enough. Genes only matter when they're expressed, when the cell decides to read them. This is where epigenetics come in. Epi, Greek for over, above, or on top of. Epigenetics is the study of how chemical markers, like methyl groups, switch genes on or off. We return to the DNA spools. A chemical tag, a methyl group, floats in and attaches directly to a gene. The proteins arrive, but cannot bind. They slide right off. This is DNA methylation, a simple chemical tag that acts as a do not read sign. It silences genes. This is histone modification. Acetylation is an open for business sign. It amplifies gene expression. So your life doesn't change your genes. It changes their annotation. You are not hardwired. You are live edited. So what controls the epigenome? Everything, your environment, your diet, your stress levels, your physical activity, your social interactions, the air you breathe, the toxins you're exposed to, nutrition, folate, vitamin B12, 
and other nutrients from your food are the raw materials used to create these methyl tags. You literally are what you eat on a genetic level. Stress. Cortisol floods your system and directly alters the epigenetic markers on genes that regulate your mood, your immune system, and your metabolism. Toxins. Chemicals in cigarette smoke can attach to DNA, causing epigenetic changes that lead to cancer. This is where the story becomes personal. This isn't just about you. If your experiences write notes in the margins of your DNA, a terrifying, beautiful question arises. Can those notes be passed down? The old dogma said no. The blueprint was wiped clean each generation. We now know that's not true. One of the most famous proofs comes from World War II, during the Dutch Hunger Winter. When blockades starved the Netherlands in 1944, people resorted to eating tulip bulbs. Thousands of pregnant women gave birth under famine conditions. Decades later, scientists studied the children who were in the womb during that famine. These individuals, now in their 60s and 70s, had specific epigenetic markers. Their bodies, sculpted by starvation in the womb, were permanently set to conserve energy. They faced higher rates of obesity, diabetes, and even heart disease. The environment of their mothers had written a permanent footnote into their genetic instruction manual. In some cases, the effect was even seen in the grandchildren of the women who endured the famine. This is transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. It's not about changing the DNA sequence, but about inheriting the settings. It's the biological basis of intergenerational trauma and, potentially, intergenerational resilience. In other words, the environment of your ancestors can still be shaping your biology today. This brings us to the weapon of choice for the modern determinist, heritability. You've probably heard people say, intelligence is 50% genetic, or height is 80% genetic. Here's the truth. This is one of the most abused statistics in all science. It means, in a given population, how much of the variation between individuals can be explained by genetic variation. If height is 80% heritable, that doesn't mean 80% of your height is genetic. It means, in the studied population, 80% of differences in height could be linked to genetic differences. Why does this matter? Because heritability changes with environment. It does not mean how much of my height is genetic. That is a meaningless question. It means, in this group of people, how much do their genetic differences explain why they are different heights? In a perfect country where everyone eats well, differences in height appear mostly genetic. In a country with widespread malnutrition or different class levels, environment explains much more. For example, in Field 1, all plants get identical, perfect soil, sun, and water. Any differences in height must be due to genetic differences. In field two, plants get wildly different amount of sun and water. The environmental differences are huge. Now, genetics explain less of the variation. Heritability is lower. Heritability doesn't measure destiny. It measures variation. But genetic determinists twist this into genes cause 80% of your height. That's simply wrong. And it's utterly context dependent. This is why the search for a gene for intelligence, or crime, or musical genius is stupid. These are polygenic traits, each with a microscopic effect. In the early 2000s, after the Human Genome Project, scientists thought we'd find the gene for everything. The intelligence gene, the gay gene, the warrior gene. But reality shattered this fantasy. Most traits are polygenic, influenced by thousands of genes, each with tiny effects interacting with environment in complex ways. The dream of simple gene for X explanations was a myth, but it continues in pop science headlines. Here's something most people miss. Genes are not timeless. They are records of survival. When people argue that genes are everything, they ignore the fact that genes themselves were and are shaped by environment across time. Populations in Africa developed dark skin because melanin protected against UV damage. Tibetans carry unique genes that help them breathe at high altitudes with thin air. Your genes are the environment of your ancestors, written into molecules. It's a two-way street. Your genes influence your predispositions, your tendencies, your potential. But your environment and your conscious choices influence which of those tendencies get expressed. It's not nature versus nurture. It's nature through nurture. The decisions you make, what you eat, how much you sleep, how you manage stress, are, in a very real way, writing the next chapter. So, 
If genetic determinism is wrong, why does it refuse to die? Three reasons. It's simple. People want black and white answers. It's comforting. If your DNA controls everything, you're not responsible for your health or choices. It sounds scientific. Throw the word genes into a conversation, and suddenly it feels legit. Let me know your thoughts on this, whether you believe in genetic determinism or heritability. Try improving what you can, and make peace with what you can't. This is The Natural Way. Thanks for watching.